Today we're going to be picking up with fracture classification. There's going to be different ways you can classify fractures. One way is going to be position of the bone ends after the fracture. So you would refer to it as non-displaced if the ends retain in their normal position, and so they're not moved. We would refer to it as a displaced fracture if the ends are out of their normal alignment. Another way to classify a fracture is what type of break it is. It could be a complete break, and that's when it's broken all the way through, or it could be referred to as an incomplete break, and that's when it's not broken all the way through, but partially. And then you can determine whether the skin is going to be penetrated to determine what type of break it is. So if it does penetrate through the skin and break comes through where you can see the bones actually poking out, that's going to be referred to as an open fracture or a compound fracture. If it does not come through the skin, it's broken and you can see it within the skin, but it's not poking out or penetrating through that skin, it's referred to as a closed fracture or a simple fracture. Also, they can be described by their location of the fracture, the external appearance of how that fracture looks, and the nature of the break. So here's some examples of some different types of fractures. First off, you have this green stick fracture. With a green stick fracture, what happens there is this usually happens in small or young children, and the bone will break, but it won't break completely through. So it's kind of like if you went up to a tree and you tried to break a branch off that was green and not dried out, it's not going to break off or snap completely. You'll have to move it back and forth over and over again and it still probably won't break through because it's going to have some flexibility to those collagenous fibers and things that are in there. And so that's why it's referred to as a green stick break. And like I said, that usually happens in children. It doesn't break completely through. The next type you might have is going to be the spiral break. And with this type of break, this is usually done by a twisting motion. And so that's where it gets the name spiral break. So think of taking something with both hands and twisting each hand a different way. That would be kind of how this break would happen. Or think of, let's say, playing baseball or golf. If you were to do a twist and that bone snapped, that would be a spiral break. Next here, you see the comminuted break. And with that type of break, it kind of breaks in several different places and it's going to crush there. You could have a transverse break, and that's where it breaks completely through on a transverse um, line or scale. You can have a compound break that you see here. See how it's sticking out of the skin and it kind of went through both of the bones there. And then you could have what's referred to as a compression break. Now with compression breaks, this happens a lot. We see here in the spinal column, it could happen with older people, and it tends to happen when they start to have a breakdown of the bone and they end up with osteoporosis. And so that bone kind of like crushes down or compacts down. So again, here's one. We're looking at actual, on the right-hand side, it's going to be an actual um, break or x-ray of a break, and that's going to be your compound or open break. So that one's actually sticking out of the skin so you can see the bone. And that's going to be in that humerus or the upper arm bone. With the next one, you're going to see that comminuted break. And that's with the humerus again, and this is where it kind of compacted down, and it's going to crush that bone in the center. Next, we have that green stick break. And like we said, this one usually happens in children. It will break on one side, but not break all the way through. Another way you can tell that this is a child is if you look at these here. Remember looking at our previous videos? These growth plates have not come together. They have not ossified or calcified. And also, looking at the wrist bones, notice how they have not come together. So this, you automatically know as a child, and the green stick break right there is common with children. Next one, you have that impacted break, and that's where those bones are going to come towards, or each end will come towards each other and kind of crush and break there. 
this is referred to a POTS break, and this is going to be a break that's found in the ankle, and that's going to be with fibula. Next, you have what's referred to as a Coley's break, and that one's going to be found in the wrist. Now, looking at this, notice how growth plates are closed. Notice how closely these wrist bones come together. So with this one, you automatically know by looking at this x-ray that this does belong to an adult. Okay, treatment for breaks is going to be reduction. So you're not, you're going to keep it from moving around. You're going to realign that broken bone in. You're going to have closed reduction. That's where a physician is going to have to go in and manipulate to correct that position. You can have an open reduction. That's where they open it up and actually surgically pin it or wire it to secure those ends so it can grow back together properly. Then you're going to have a mobilization, and that's usually done by a cast or by traction for healing. So you don't want it to, once they realigned it, you don't want it to move around and come out of alignment. And of course, what type they use is going to depend on the break, severity, the bone that is broken, and even the age of the patient. If somebody who's very young breaks a bone, that bone, let's say they're four, five, six, that bone can grow back and actually heal within three to four weeks. If it's somebody who's a teenager, it might take about four weeks, maybe five. If it's somebody who's older, it could take, like in their 40s, 50s, 60s, it could take anywhere from four to six weeks for it to heal. And older, it could take even six to eight weeks to heal. So it depends on the person's age. It depends on their health already and how active that they are and just how well their immune system heals things. So when you're going in to heal a break, first thing that's gonna form is going to be a hematoma. So you've got that hematoma forming, that's basically gonna be a blood clot that comes in. And so you see those arteries that were in there. Those arteries are going to break through this section. They release blood. They form a blood clot there. Now you have to be careful because sometimes if you break these arteries, you can actually bleed out. It could actually be life-threatening. So, but the arteries here, they're going to go in, they're going to fill in that space, and they create a hematoma. So here we have torn blood vessels, clot forms, swollen. It's going to be painful. It's also going to be inflamed, so you feel heat there. Next, you're going to have that fibrocartilage um, come in and form a fibrocartilaginous callus. So the capillaries are going to grow into the hematoma. So you see how those capillaries are starting to form through this section. This, notice it's no longer a bloody blood clot there. It's changing over into cartilage. The fibroblasts there, or the cells that you see there, are going to start to secrete those collagen fibers. Um, and then next, the bone's going to start to reconstruct itself and start to rebuild. So massive repair tissue is fibrocartilage callus. So we're going to refer to this as the callus, the whole section there. Next, the bony callus is going to come in and start to form. Now with the bony callus, that's going to start to appear within a week. Those trabeculae are going to form in that fibrocartilaginous callus. So we see them start to form through here. The callus is then going to be converted to the bony callus, a spongy bone. And in around two months or less later, it's going to completely form that union and completely come together. In the fourth stage, you're going to have the bone remodeling and what's going to happen there, notice how on the sides here and on the sides here and through here, notice how it swole and it came out and created that bony callus. Well, over time, that's going to help it not break there again, but it's going to make the areas above it and below it kind of weaker. So they might break either above or below. But with that section there, over time, you're going to have this osteoclast constantly eating away at where this bony callus is. And as it's eating away with that, it's going to be remodeling it and changing it to be smoother. And so over time, it will completely remodel or get rid of this, especially if you're younger. 
It'll do it a lot quicker and you won't even be able to tell that there was a break there. If you're older, there might be slight sections where it doesn't completely remodel completely flat. Now looking at the composition of bone, notice how the different minerals and um, salts that you'll find in there. So you have calcium making up 39% of the composition of the bone. And that's where 99% of the body's calcium is actually going to be stored. Next, you have your potassium. That's going to be about 0.2% of the bone. And that's where 4% of the body's potassium is. Then we go to sodium. You have about 0.7% of that bone is going to be composed of it. But that's going to be 35% of the body sodium there. Magnesium, you have 0.4% there, but you'll find it's actually 50% of the body's magnesium. Carbonate is going to be at 9.7% of bone, and that's 80% of the body's carbonate stored there. And then the phosphates make up 17% of the bone, but 99% of the phosphate that the body needs is going to be stored in the bone. So what this means over here is that if your body's running low on any of these nutrients, it can simply send the osteoblast in, eat away at the bone, and as it's eating away at the bone, it's going to release these into the bloodstream, and then they'll be used for whatever they're needed for. Next time you eat or next time you replenish these, uh, these um, nutrients over here, they will then go and be put back into the bone by the osteoblasts. Bone homeostasis, um, with the bones, it's going to recycle anywhere from 5 to 7% of the bone mass each week. Spongy bone is going to be replaced about every 3 to 4 years. Compact bone is going to be replaced about every 10 years. So at any one given point, your entire skeleton is not going to be any older than 10 years old because it's constantly replacing itself. It's going to consist of bone remodeling as well as bone repair. And so it's constantly remodeling itself. That's why if you were to break something or sprain something or get hurt, they try to have you walk with a um, regular gait or a regular stride. They try not to have you hop or hobble or walk funny to keep the um, pressure off of it or the weight off of it because since this bone is constantly remodeling and constantly replacing itself, you don't want it to remodel itself by the way that you're walking just because it's injured because then you're going to possibly have to use something like a brace to fix how your bone was remodeled improperly. So it could permanently change how you walk if you do that when you're hurt. What it's going to do, you have that surface of periosteum and then the endosteum. Those are the sections that are going to be constantly either eaten away at or the bone is going to be put back onto. And so this is going to occur continuously, but it's also going to be re regulated by genetic factors and two control loops. First, you have your negative control. Remember with neg negative control, it's always going to go in the reverse or opposite of what it's doing. So if um, you're getting really hot, the negative would be to cool you down. So it's going in the opposite. If you're getting too cold, the negative would be to make you warmer. So it's always going in the opposite. And so you have a negative feedback hormonal loop for calcium homeostasis. So let's say that your calcium levels are low and calcium is going to be very important in things like muscle contractions and nerve impulses. What your body would do, it would send osteoclasts in to eat away at that bone. It would release the calcium into the bloodstream and then that calcium would be able to be used within the nervous system and muscle contractions. So that would be a negative feedback loop. So like we said, helps control blood calcium levels. It's responses to mechanical and gravitational forces. So gravity also pulling on your body will determine on how your bone is going to be reshaped. Nutritional and hormonal factors affecting bone growth and maintenance. First, you have minerals that your body does require that you need to get through your food. It's going to be calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, iron, fluorine, and manganese. You also need calcitriol. That's the hormone needed to 
for normal calcium and phosphate ions to absorb in the digestive tract. We talked about that in the integumentary system. Remember, that's going to be your precursor to your vitamin D3. You also need vitamin C. That's going to be needed for collagen synthesis. Lots of times you think of vitamin C as helping you with your immune system, and it does. Because, remember, your white blood cells are going to be made within the bone. All those blood cells are made inside the bone marrow. And so these vitamin C fiber, or vitamin C, is going to help create those collagenous fibers, which are going to be the framework for the actual hard part of the bone being put down. Next, you need vitamins A, K, and B12. These are going to be needed to stimulate bone growth and protein synthesis. You also need growth hormones and thyroxin. These are going to be hormones that stimulate um, your different your bone growth or as far as long and as far as width. And so with these, you have the HDH or human growth hormone, and then the thyroxin is a thyroid hormone. And you also need sex hormones. These are also going to help stimulate bone growth. Mainly testosterone helps with growth. And you have the parathyroid hormone. The parathyroid is going to be found on the posterior section of the thyroid, and it's going to help with calcitonin. So hormonal control of blood calcium levels, like we said, controlled by the parathyroid hormone. Often it's going to be... Um, abbreviated with PTH. It's produced by the parathyroid glands. Like I said, they're going to be in the posterior section of the thyroid. It helps remove calcium from bone regardless of bone integrity. So if you really need calcium, if you need this for your nervous system and to help make things work, your body, regardless of how weak your bones are, is going to go in. It's going to eat away at that bone using the osteoclast, release it into the bloodstream, and then it can be used from there. Calcitonin may be involved. It's going to be produced by the parafollicular cells in the thyroid gland. In high doses, it's going to lower blood calcium levels temporarily. And basically, it's going to take that calcium out of the bloodstream and it's going to redeposit it onto that bone. Bone reabsorption is going to be accomplished by the osteoclasts. They're the ones that are um, secreting kind of an acidic substance which is going to help eat away at the bone and break down that um, hydroxyapatite and release all its nutrients into the bloodstream. It will dig depressions or even grooves as it breaks down the matrix of the bone. It secretes like I said a lysosomal enzyme that digests the matrix. It's going to be acidic. It secretes proton hydrogens, which converts calcium salts into soluble forms, so it can go into the bloodstream. The osteoclasts are also going to be able to phagocytize and demineralize the matrix and get rid of the dead osteocytes. They're going to use transcytosis. That's where it can come in one side of the cell, go through the cell, and exit through the other side of the cell. That transcytosis is going to allow for the release into the interstitial fluids and then into the blood. Once reabsorption is complete, these osteoclasts are going to undergo apoptosis. So once they're done, they have a regulated cell suicide, so they get rid of themselves. These osteoclast activation is going to involve the parathyroid hormone and other factors. So with the negative feedback loop, um, for calcium homeostasis, controlled, like we said, by PTH or parathyroid hormone. It's going to come and cause the blood calcium levels to go down. PTH is going to be released when that happens. The PTH stimulates osteoclast to start degrading and breaking down that bone matrix. When it does, it releases that calcium into the bloodstream. Your blood calcium levels are going to go back up, and then the PTH release ends. All right, so here is just looking at a video, and this is going to show the different things that go into actually putting calcium back into the blood. So the parathyroid gland is going to release the PTH. That's going to act on the bone. When it acts on the bone, it's going to cause oops, it's going to cause those osteoclasts. 
to be stimulated. They're going to eat away at the bone. They release the calcium ions into the bloodstream. And so that's going to bring it up. It could also help with interstitial absorption of calcium. And so it's going to absorb it and take that into the bloodstream there. Or it can also activate the kidneys to absorb cal calcium ions when it's filtering the blood and making its filtrate for urine. And so then it can bring up the blood calcium levels. Now factors that decrease blood calcium. You're going to have the thyroid gland, which is going to respond by its C cells that are going to secrete calcitonin. That calcitonin is going to work on the same um, things if it's on the bone. The osteoclast activity is going to decrease or even stop. Osteoblast activity is going to be unaffected. It could work on the interstitial intestinal sorry, response, and so that's where it's going to go in, and it's going to absorb that calcium into the intestines, and then the blood level is going to decrease, or the kidney can excrete calcium ions into the filtrate, which then becomes urine that the body can get rid of. So calcium is going to be very, very important in the body. Like I said, it's going to help with nerve impulse transmission. It's going to help with polarization and depolarization and helping that action potential actually travel down that nerve impulse. It's going to help with muscle contractions. It's going to help with blood coagulation or clotting. And it's going to help with cell division or mitosis. 1,200 to 1,400 grams of calcium in the body is going to be what you want on average, 99% like we said, is going to be found in bone minerals. The amount in blood is going to be tightly regulated by the homeostatic system, and you want around 9 to 11 milligrams per deciliter. The intestinal absorption is going to require vitamin D metabolics in order to be able to absorb that. Remember, you can take that in through food, or you can use the calciferol that's going to be converted over when you're exposed to sunlight to create that vitamin D. So dietary intake is really going to be required because lots of people don't spend enough time outside. Okay. And so that is going to end us for this section. And I will see you with the next section where we start talking about the um, axial skeleton.